Hi, uh, I'm David Keogh, and I'm part of the Inspiring Guest Programme at TBS. And I'm an actor, screenwriter, I'm an ex-MD of a fintech company, and I've also spent 20 years in financial services uh, internationally and uh, in the UK. And today I'll be interviewing um, Philippe Gillis, who is the CEO of uh, Cantox, and, and a star TBS alumni as well. Um, uh, and um, Cantox is a, is a fintech company dealing in um, FX foreign exchange. And I'm sure we'll get to hear much more about what that means uh, when I start speaking to Philippe. What kind of background did you have? I mean, I always say the typical uh, boring French story. So, I mean, you go to class preparatoire, then Toulouse Business School that at that time was uh, ESC Toulouse. Uh, after that, I, I, I mean, I did something interesting when I was in TBS. Uh, I was in one of the first, let's say, year where it was possible to basically spend uh, three years in three different countries. So I did year wow. one in Toulouse. I did second year in Barcelona campus. I did a third year, third year as a, a one year uh, practice. So Césure, as I name it, uh, in Switzerland. Yeah. And I did my last year in uh, Mexico. Wow. Uh, which was, uh, as you may imagine, quite an adventure. Yeah, so I can I, I maximized the opportunities to, to travel uh, and it was really, uh, really amazing. And after that, uh, seven years of uh, boring life in consulting. And I've been there as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I learned a lot, but yeah, and with consulting that my opinion and, and anyone, we need people for, for everything. I mean, but at some point you understand that you are spending more time on, on theory and not PowerPoints than really on, on doing things. And I, and I wanted to do things. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So once I had the idea and I had the luck, if I can say that way, of finding a co-founders and building a team, then there was no way back. I resigned and, and we started. What did you want to be when you were a kid, uh, Philippe? It seems strange, but I seem from maybe 13 or 14, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Brilliant. I never wanted to be a football player, an, an actor, sorry, or this kind of thing, or a singer. Uh, from very young, I wanted to be, a, to be an entrepreneur. And um, where did that come from? Good question. I mean, my, my, my father was an entrepreneur, uh, I mean, at small scale in, in, a, okay. uh, in, in, in England, you would better say a, like a freelancer. Okay. Uh, my family had a, um, a restaurant, which is a kind of low scale entrepreneurship, but let's say I, they had this kind of freedom uh, and opportunity to, 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 to do things as they wanted. So probably I got inspired in some way uh, by them without being really conscious. But I think it was a, uh, it was what really happened, and and then you know I had I had this ambition of doing things differently, new things, building new stuff, inventing, being innovative. I I never really wanted to be working in a large company, even if I did it when I was uh, in in my uh, one year practice. I was in Renault, so imagine the large French corporation, sure, old school, lot of rules, lot of processes. You cannot yeah. really you cannot make any kind of difference on anything you can just work hard be good and hope that every year you will progress slowly and eventually 30 years later you will have an opportunity to yeah. to make a difference in the company but but this was not for me at all and, and in large corps i mean the for me the the risk reward is not good at all uh, yeah. why because the reward is good very quickly but the reward is never stellar yeah I agree. I uh, agree so, entirely. You know, you just play to have a, a good uh, a good way of life, but not much more. And this was not my game. So, um, tell me more about Cantox then. Um, tell me a little bit, a kind of overview of, of of where where it's come from and and what gap in the market you're exploiting. So, the origin of the company, um, we are three co-founders, um, and one of them and myself, we were working in Deloitte and in consulting strategy. Okay. And this is where first we, we, we were quite uh, confident that what had happened in many other industries was going to happen in finance, which means disruption related to uh, innovation, uh, internet and the likes. And so we were looking for ideas and basically speaking with clients, we understood that in, in foreign exchange, B2B, um, 
it was very old school, very manual, very little technology, yeah. no transparency on prices. So imagine it was like retail banking before it was online, you know, so yeah. very inconvenient. And so we said, look, we think that the finance industry will dramatically change in the next 10, 20 years. We have discovered this pain point that most customers have, which is foreign exchange. Let's build a company around that. So it was a bit more than 10 years ago. So we have gone through what uh, we can name the the valley of death. You know, after 10 years, if you are still in business, yeah. probably it's that you have built something which is- now, with... now you're up the mountain of hope. Yeah, so it's probably <laughs> resilient enough. But but I mean, the company, if I can say that we had, had two different lives. Uh, first five years, our, our product was mainly focused on being much cheaper than banks. So being online, but being much cheaper yeah. than banks. And we had a model which was very much based on peer-to-peer. -peer. So we had businesses on the, comp on, on, on the platform and some were selling currencies, some were buying, and basically we were managing the exchange. But we saw limitations in that because you have a, a problem with liquidity, so uh, balancing offer and demand. So it makes growth harder. Yeah. And on the long term, if you focus only on lower prices, we were always joking that there is always someone dumber to play the game and basically offer a lower price until the moment, sure. basically it's free. And so f I, in 2016, 17, even if the company were growing well, we had growth every year, 200% or more than this, we understood that we had to be much better on technology, much different. And what, so on- what, what caused that change, Philip? When, at what point did you go, right, we need to change? Because that's a big change of tack if that was your original plan. That must've been quite scary, right? That's a massive change, but when you are in a business, and in particular a business which is moving fast with a lot of innovation, you know, or let's say you have the gut feeling that if you wait for problems to really come to change, it will be extremely painful. And probably you will not have time to change and you will eventually die. So you need in fast moving industries to make these kind of tough decisions way earlier than in more traditional industry. And so we were convinced that five years later, trying to be the cheapest in the market was not a great game to play. Okay. Uh, and this is why we, we started seeking what we can do. And finally, speaking with a lot of clients, because usually the answer come from the clients. I mean, it's not that you invent things out of the blue. You listen, you listen, and at some point you, you connect the dots to use a famous uh, uh, yeah. sentence. And this is where you, you start getting a vision of your new positioning and new product. And what, so what we started doing is building a, a software that we connect to clients' uh, systems, so an ERP or treasury system. And basically, this software through the API connection is able to manage all the risk related to foreign currency and volatility in a fully automated fashion. So you stop having people, humans, on uh, in the client team deciding to buy and sell currencies to hedge the risk. It's really our software based on the information in the ERP of the clients that's executing all the transactions 24 hours a day, five days a week uh, in a millisecond. And, and, these... and, and can it be used for other types of hedging as well? Or is it just currency? Is it something you could expand to other things or is it not really? I would say that on the long term, uh, commodities might be uh, a segment where we can basically do exactly the same. I'm thinking about the gas crisis at the moment where a lot of companies in the UK are going bust, six of them as up to this week, because um, they haven't hedged their prices, their fuel prices. So, so that's my, why I asked the question. My answer is yes, but the, the FX market is so massive. We are still so small. Okay. Uh, it's so global and we are still 95% European, even if we start getting clients in the US, that I think for at least the next three or five years, we will still be fully focused on FX and only FX. So really the challenge is to get more clients, to become really global, to be on each continent, to go after larger clients. So it's not about reinventing the wheel. Okay. Now it's about scaling what we have. And, and, and what's your, um, your tactics, Philippe? Do you tend to look at um, some of the up and coming new competitor companies? Because I guess if you've been around since 2011, there's some small copycats trying to do what you do. Do you, do you look to absorb the more in, um, innovative ones? Uh, is, is that part of your plan or do you have, is what you've got still so market leading? You don't need to do that yet. So it's a, it's a good question. I mean, when we were focused on, on prices in the beginning, they started having not a massive number of competitors because with regulation, you have a barrier to entry, but 
we started to see more and more competition and even banks started to, to basically decrease prices. Okay. Uh, when we started building these much more complex and sophisticated software solutions, we understood that naturally this will be much harder to copy, much harder to build, and more important, much harder to sell because you need to develop a lot of client knowledge, industry yeah. knowledge. And so four years later, we have basically still no competition. And when I say that, people always say, wow, it's amazing. You have no competition, so it's super easy. No, it's not. Because when you have no competition, it basically means that you have to educate the market yeah. about your product by yourself and there will no one else. Yeah. So you, can, so you can't steal business from other competitors because there's none there. You, the you big can bank. steal and very often clients are not really looking for solution like ours. No. On, they don't even know it exists, you know, so you really have to educate them from scratch to explain that they can completely change their, their approach to managing effects, which is from, let's say, man, uh, human management to machine management. So it's really a, a, a completely new way of, of approaching uh, the FX challenge. And so, again, it's about spreading the world, explaining how products like ours uh, exist, how they work, how they bring value. And I mean, as a tech company and a startup, you have limited resources, so you cannot spend uh, millions of dollars just for advertising. Sure. So there are pros in, in having no competition, but there are also cons. How are you keeping up with some of the other advances, things like AI, blockchain, these types of things, which are starting to take over a lot of businesses now? Um, are, are you finding that you're having to adapt to some of these before they outpace you, or are they not things that you need to think about yet? So AI uh, is... Well, let's say differently, 95% of companies that speak about AI, uh, it's just a, a bullshit marketing. Yeah, it's just argument. an algorithm, isn't it? It's not really AI. There is zero intelligence. Yeah. There is uh, an algorithm which artificially replicates something we told him to do. Uh, and if you're interested in AI, uh, one of the smartest and best person globally in AI is someone from Toulouse. Uh, is, uh, Julia, I think it's Mark Julia, I'm not sure, uh, but he, he's, he has spent most of his career in, in Silicon Valley working in AI. He's back in France now, if I'm not wrong. And, and there are some podcasts and interviews about him. So if you like AI, uh, read his interviews because he's really incredible. And, and, and he basically tells the same. I mean, when people say AI will change everything and some people are very concerned about AI taking the lead, like in Terminator, I mean, the guys say, this is just ridiculous. I mean, this is not at all what AI is. So AI, we are not worried at all. Blockchain, if you speak about blockchain as a technology, we always say we don't care about technology in the sense that if instead of using SWIFT or global payment rails to move money around the world, everyone start using blockchain, we will use blockchain too. Sure. But what we are really doing and our value is really the software that manage risk and which is fully built in-house. So okay. All the, all oh, this so kind you of built your own software. You didn't you didn't adapt something else. You actually... No, no, we built it from scratch wow. internally. Okay. And so it's like crypto. You know, people say, yeah, but crypto they will disrupt everything. So first, I'm still a bit skeptic. But if tomorrow yeah, instead of using US dollar, we were using a crypto, okay, okay, the problem of volatility will still exist. So we are not too much concerned by that. And I have a tendency to say that. As an entrepreneur, you should spend much more time in trying to bring value to clients and in being worried about competition. Even if, depending on the industry, you have to know what competitors are doing and, and you have to be aware. But the time you focus on competition, you, you don't focus on bringing more value to your clients. In the end, it's clients, totally clients, agree. clients. If you are super slow, yeah, you should be paranoid about competition. But the problem is not competition. The problem is that you are super slow. True. So the thing that um, really... Uh, I, I guess got my attention when I looked at your website was the number of industries that you cover. How have you managed to expand into so many different markets? Do, do you need to be experts in all of them or is it pretty much the same problem regardless of the industry? So first, when we started building the product, uh, we built it for clients in the travel tourism industry. So it was very focused on a single industry, okay. which had a, a massive pain point with, with foreign exchange. But then on the long term, if you want to grow, you cannot stay in a single industry. So after probably a couple of years uh, building and, and, and selling the product to travel companies, 
we decided that it was time to start looking uh, looking to other industry. And to your question, it's not like all industries are completely different from one another. There are some similarities in some cases, but there are also always some specificity to, to any industry. And you don't need to be an expert in the industry at large, but you need to understand extremely well what we name the cash cycles. Okay. And so the, the specific way uh, they are exposed to foreign currencies and to foreign exchange risk. So do you have to split your, um, your sales teams yes. by industry to make that make sense, do you? Okay. Yes, because in each industry, you have one or two very specific use cases. And so you cannot have a salesperson knowing 30 or 40 use cases well. You can have someone focused on maybe two or three industries, but not on 10. So yes, we are specializing okay. the team. And are there any new industries coming up that you're, you're targeting or looking at? Mm, I think we have not done anything still with uh, airlines, which okay. is more sub-industry at an industry by itself. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's coming. So um, when you started in 2011, you said um, you called it the Valley of Despair. Um, <laughs> I'm, I've been in the Valley of Despair a few times myself, so I know what that's like. Um, were there any point, were there any points during that period where you wanted to give up or felt like giving up? No, wanted to give up. It was never, never something we, we even discussed uh, five minutes. Uh, we had some tough time. I remember once, just before raising our Series A, uh, I think at some point we had maybe 2,000 euros left on the bank account. And two wow. weeks later, we had like uh, overall 50,000 euros to pay out, you know, to suppliers, uh, employees, That's stuff tough. like this. So we had a couple of tough times in that sense. But giving up was was never uh, a possibility, and I would say it's probably the most important um, thing uh, to to be successful at some point. I mean, in the end, it's about resilience. So if you are really persistent and you never give up in entrepreneurship, at some point, you will find the right formula. You will probably get a bit of luck. I mean, you need luck. Any success at some point? Well, I think Arnold Palmer, the golfer, said you make your own luck. I think he, he scored a hole in one once, and someone asked him if it was um, uh, if it was skill uh, or no, if he was lucky. And he said, "Yeah, it's funny. The, uh, the harder I work, the more I train, the luckier I get." I think was what he but said. Because in the end, the, the more time you spend on it, the more probability that luck will come. I mean, if you work hard on, on a business during six months and you stop. So probability of being lucky in a six month period is small. If you work hard during 10 years, probability of being lucky at some point is much higher. So in the end, that's, that's why working hard and, and, and resilience and, and not quitting is really what makes all the difference because at some point, something will happen that will make that your, your formula will start working and that you will start really being successful. And, and um, what have you had to sacrifice to get where you are and the other founders too i guess because uh, you know I, I guess you were all in it together i would say nothing i mean eventually you are uh, you are assuming a very small risk which is if i go out of the corporate world and if i fail and i have to come back to the corporate world it will be uh, harder but i would say this was true 10 years ago and it is not anymore. I mean, let's take fintech and finance. If you are nowadays uh, a, young, uh, a young executive in a bank, let's say, yeah. or I oversimplify, okay? You spend three years in a bank, you go out, you launch a fintech company, after two years, you fail. So you have worked five years, you are eventually much more attractive for any bank than a young executive that has spent five years in a bank and that, that has not learned about innovation and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So it's not like failure is necessarily much better accepted nowadays, but if you have spent time in technology, fintech or anything else for a bank, you are 10 times more valuable as a typical bank executive because basically you have 
tens of thousands of them, which are basically the same ones from the same school with the same knowledge. And, and how do the other uh, founders complement you? Are they? How do you all complement each other? Are you very different characters? Uh, first one thing that we have done well from the beginning, and I'm not even sure it was on purpose. Uh, one, one is engineer, so he's a CTO, and he, he was not involved at all in anything not engineering. The other one is very, very focused on, on sales and clients. Okay. And I'm focused on all the rest. And so we were never really at any point uh, doing the same thing. So then you, I mean, you, 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 uh, you can have different opinions on things that are much more about uh, uh, fundraising, long-term strategy and things like this. But if you have roles that are very complementary in day to day, the risk of at some point having friction is lower. And, and how, do you, how do you make sure that there's the right level of friction there? And I don't mean between the three of you, but I mean underneath you on those, those senior managers that now must report into you. How do, how do you ensure they're empowered and they don't have to? Because this was a, an issue we had in the fintech company I worked in, was that everybody was too scared to make a decision without getting the founders to make the decisions. And, um, and the founders had agreed to leave um, a year earlier so for a year the company was completely paralyzed i mean if you have a product that's reasonably good which means there is a demand for your product uh, client use it client pay for it the only thing that will on the long run make that your company grow and is successful or stay stuck is really uh, the team people and people management That said, how do you make sure that the team is high performance and, and delivering? I always say it's more an art than a science. Uh, and it's extremely challenging because, yeah, you need to, 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 to uh, attract and hire and retain and motivate uh, talented people, uh, people that are very good at executing with experience and blah, blah. But first, this is much easier to say than to do. And in, yeah, part is, yeah. in particular, when it's your first company, uh, when it's your first company. And when you start off, you hire more wrong people, yeah. don't you? It takes a while to learn the people that will let you down. But I think even, even as a very experienced hirer, I hired hundreds of people. I think one in 10, no matter what you do, is always a bad hire and you can't avoid it because people can just get through the process and even suck on me and I'm quite good at spotting the bad ones. Exactly. But I mean, when, then it's different. when you get experience and when your company grow, when you start having enough good people in, let's say, middle management and management, yeah. when you do a bad hire from time to time, it's less important and less impactful. When you do bad hires in management early in the company, this is where it can really be uh, painful. But again, this is, I always say, building tech companies um, in some ways um, is a team sport and is a sport. So sure. uh, I always say uh, it's a bit like uh, training a team in football, in rugby, in, in Formula One, in anything. Um, I, I read a couple of books about very famous uh, uh, football trainers. I don't really like football, but uh, the books were good. I mean, because they explained how they manage uh, the Eagles, how they manage... Uh, the fact that some some players may have at some point personal problems or stuff like yeah. this. So really uh, about people management, these kind of books are very good because it's it's people management on, on steroids, if I can say it that way. What is the thing that you look for in people that work for you to make sure that you keep agile? That's a good question. And it's not easy to answer because you never, you never, really know the mindset of someone with some interviews. I mean, you really need to work with a person. But what shows sure that what we do, we have a, we have a team um, whose average age is, I think it's 31 or two, maybe something like this. So these are just post millennials or millennials? Uh, I don't know. Well, you know, I'm always lost with millennials. Gen I think X, millennials go up to about 30. I'm not hundred percent sure now. I, uh, well, maybe look, anyway, when, when we hire people first, we don't want people that have been, even there are some exceptions, in the typical uh, large corporate in an executive role, or at least for too long. Yeah. I mean, if someone has 
eight or ten years experience and has spent a couple of years in a large corporate, that's not an issue. But we want people that have been by default used to uh, small or mid-sized companies, fast-moving environments, uh, challenging job, uh, and that we feel that in some ways they have, let's say, this passion and energy. Yeah. I mean, when, when we interview people and when we make debriefs about people to decide if we make an offer or no, uh, patient and energy is, is something very important. Uh, and, and to come back to your comment, patient and energy is not something you find much in a bank. So uh, let's talk a little bit about fintech then. What's, uh, what are the exciting, cool fintech companies that you see out there? Are they related to your industry or not? What are the ones that you look at and think, oh, they're interesting? <laughs> I mean, what's interesting about fintech is if you look at finance, it's, if I'm not wrong, the biggest industry in the world. If you look at uh, GDP, I think finance is it's maybe 15% of global GDP. So it's much more than. Uh, I think in, in Britain, it's our biggest export, yeah. actually. Oh, is this for sure? But I mean, it's bigger than uh, some food, it's bigger than. So it's really a massive industry. And it's probably one of the few that have been still not that much disrupted. And it's an extremely complex industry because you have uh, retail banking, you have SME banking, you have uh, corporate banking, you have wealth management, you have uh, lending, you have a remittance. You know I mean, yeah. if, if you really cut the bank by product in pieces, you have uh, tens of different pieces. And what has happened in the last 10 years, what I named the, the first wave of fintech is a lot of focus on retail, a bit on SME, uh, a lot of focus on providing um, online solutions with very good user experience, better price, some nice marketing. Yeah. But we, ha we have not seen a lot of fundamentally new things. What I mean is if you look at all the fintechs nowadays, and if you exclude crypto, which is something a bit different, basically there is no product innovation. It's just a different way, a what, better what, way. What stops that? Is it legislation, regulation? What? No, it's just that you know it's it's about going after the low hanging fruit. I mean, okay. If you if you know that banks are overcharging retail and SME clients on uh, foreign exchange and cross border payment, and you can be ten times cheaper do nice marketing and grow very well with that positioning, that's fine, it's slowing in fruit. Will you start by saying, I will rebuild from scratch a completely new global payment system completely separated from what already exists? Mm, maybe it would have been too ambitious 10 years ago. Maybe in two years, it's not too ambitious anymore. So in the last 10 years, again, we have seen products that were already existing distributing in a much nicer way, better way, with better UX, better prices, and many things. But the product itself, we have not seen almost anything fundamentally new. And I, I think, think in I, the future, I, 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 this will be the case. Are you worried by companies like um, Apple, et cetera, who are, you know, they're buying up and getting banking licenses. These, you know, they're sniffing around the banks to see what they can take. No. So my view is uh, what we can name the the GAFA, the Google, the Amazon, the Facebook, uh, the Apple, they are already entering financial services. And what they want to do is to leverage the fact that they have a massive number of clients or users to sell them financial services or to distribute financial services because in the end, it's a profitable thing to do. In my opinion, they will never, never try to become banks. Why? Uh, several reasons. First, banking is a highly regulated business. And these companies that are global and that, as you know, don't like regulation a lot, uh, I don't see them even one second trying to become banks, so having banking licenses, because they know it will be a pain. Second, banking is not a profitable business. If you really do banking at large, if you look at the profitability and return and market capitalization compared to these companies, yeah. it's not a good business to be. In. Offering payment through the mobile phone as Apple Pay is doing, it's not being in banking. 
it's having a partner Goldman Sachs powering all the financial thing. And the only thing you do is use your phone that the client, the user already has in hands to distribute in a better way an Apple card. So they want a partner doing all the stuff they don't like, and they want to leverage their brand as a rich to distribute financial services. Same for Amazon, same for, for, for Google, same for Facebook. So I don't think they will never become bank, but they so will be more involved in financial services for sure. So what's the next big threat to the FX business then? The next big um, disruption other than yourselves? I, I mean, what I see will happen in the future, and I don't know how, will probably be that global payments will be more and more in real time. Uh, and why? Because the existing players and, and backbones like Swift are pushing more and more for that. I mean, they're real time in the UK now into, into bank payments. That's they, they are real time in, uh, in Europe. But that's a pretty new thing. So they are real time in Europe. Uh, in each country, you can do, or most of them are real time payments super easily. In some cases, you can even do it inside Europe from one country to another. But mm -hmm. here we speak about same currency payments. When you go to really foreign currency payments, so moving money from euro to US dollar in a millisecond, this will still take time, but it will happen. But then to have really global payments, many different countries, many different currencies, real time, we still have a long way to go. I think that we can see some innovation and some new backbone, so some kind of stable coins or stuff like this. But it will not change the fact that from the moment you have different currencies, you have exchange rates that are changing, there is volatility. And so in our case, we are still needed. So I'm not worried about the global payment, let's say infrastructure to fundamentally change and not being out of business. This I think is not really a risk. I remember when we started, someone told me, your business makes zero sense because soon we will have a single currency globally. Yeah. <laughs> That's going I, well. see, I see. I see. I see. The guy is still waiting for the single currency. <laughs> um, what does it take to stay a disruptor then? Mindset. Just mindset. Mindset in the sense that you 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 need to naturally never be happy with what you have and always wanting something new, something better. Never resting. Do, do, do you feel like that now? Do you go to bed at night thinking you still haven't achieved? your original oh, yes. goal, whatever that is. So does it, does it always move further ahead every time you, you think you've got that? Yes, and in particular, in terms of, of product and technology, I mean, for me, I always say the product will never be finished and we always want something new, something better. I mean, you know, we could say, look, we have a good product. We have no really no direct competition. Let's just try to sell what we have to more people. But no, I mean, innovating and being, and being at the forefront is a mindset and you should never stop independently of if there is competition or not, it's not the point. Uh, you must be, it must be quite all consuming being a founder in that every moment of your life must be the business to an extent, but how do you let down your hair after work? How do you uh, relax? What are your passions outside of work? So apart from Formula One and motorsport. So when you are, when you are, um... When you're an entrepreneur, and in particular in technology where, where the pace is, is very fast, uh, in some way you work uh, every day of the year. Uh, of course, yeah. And, and I was going to say 24 hours a day, no, because you sleep, even if sometimes you wake up uh, and you think about business. But I mean, it's almost impossible not to think about business uh, all the time. What you need to be able to do first is to make sure you maintain, uh, or you try to maintain um, some kind of life balance. So what, what I always say is now is a bit more experience. First, uh, sport is mandatory because it's, it's, it's a way naturally for your, for your body to, to distress. So what do you do? What sport do you do? I go running, uh, I go running, uh, I do a bit of, of CrossFit, stuff like this. But do, do you find that quite meditative? Do you, because you're... Uh, for me, it's my, I, I was doing it before, but I mean, when you are in a high stress environment, making sure you have uh, 30 or 40 or 50 minutes of sport almost every day 
yeah. is mandatory to evacuate stress. And I think that people that at some point don't keep up or, or go to burnouts is because they have one of the things they have not done is this one. So definitely. And with that, it needs to be the same thing, but try to uh, eat well and sleep. I mean, founders or entrepreneurs, leaders that at some point sleeps very little, uh, it's not sustainable. I mean, it's a long-term game, but what's challenging is that it's, it, I always say it's not like a, a marathon, it's the duration of a marathon, but you are doing sprints after sprints. So sleeping, doing sport, eating well, if you want to play for 10 years, it's mandatory. Uh, there is no other way. Uh, but again, you will never be able really to, to, to really stop thinking about the business because it always comes to your mind. And this is, you have to accept that. I mean, being an entrepreneur in particular in tech, it's accepting to live under stress constantly. If you don't like stress and pressure, I mean, this is not for you because it's constant stress and pressure. So, or you learn how to live with it and to be fine with it. But if not, it will, it will probably burn you. Um, and what will cause you to finally climb off the hamster wheel? Will it be a huge company coming in and trying to buy you out? Will it be just when you feel that you've achieved everything you can achieve or, or will you just carry on, do you think? Uh, I don't know. And, and I don't care because I, if at some point I'm, I'm not leading the company anymore for any reason, I will be the another one. You'll never stop. This is you. This is what you do. Yeah, no, I think I think I will be another one. I'm, I'm almost certain. So maybe it's in one year, maybe it's in five years. I don't know, but I'm sure I will be another one because I love I, I love the journey. I mean, in the end, the, the real excitement in, in entrepreneurship is, is more the journey than the outcome. So if the outcome is good, definitely it's better. Uh, but 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 it's really about the journey. And, and when you speak to entrepreneurs uh, that have a no, no, at least five years experience in tech, most of them will tell the same. I mean, the excitement is, is a journey. I mean, eventually at some point, again, you have a good outcome or eventually a financial good outcome. But, but the journey is really what makes the difference and, and what is exciting. So uh, when you have played once, you want to play again. And, and the good thing is that it's a sport you can play all your life. You know, the sports at 30, 35, you have to stop. This one, you can play lifelong. 